All right, so we've begun. Okay, uh, good evening, good evening, and thank you, thank you for joining us. Uh, I am Neil Lester, I'm a professor here at ASU, and, and I uh, direct something called Project Humanities, and we're hosting this as part of our 10-year anniversary. But enough about me, because this movie is really what we wanna talk about, and I wanna give you an opportunity uh, to be as excited as I am to interact with these wonderful panelists and facilitator that we have tonight. So please, please, please stand up and stretch, grab a snack, but please stay with us because there's a lot of stuff to talk about here. We'll be monitoring your stuff in the chat uh, and our panelists and our facilitators will sort of walk us through what really uh, stands out to them in the film. But let me just give you a very uh, short snapshot of who these folks are who are gonna be uh, guiding us through the conversation. Uh, but thank you, thank you, thank you for coming because I know you could be someplace else other than here with us. Facilitating this tonight is uh, Dr. Mary Margaret Funno, who is Professor Emerita uh, of ASU and uh, a Professor of Women and Gender Studies and the founding director of the School of Social Transformation here at ASU. She has published extensively on women's labor activism and is the author of books on women unions as well as transnational alliances between women and labor. So thank you very much, Professor Fono, for joining us. Uh, with her is Laura Terich, who is the president of the Central Phoenix Inez Cassiano chapter of NOW, the National Organization for Women, where she's also the legislative liaison. She's a former educator uh, and serves uh, in the capacity of engaging people civically through voting anything and everything that has to do with women's issues, racial and economic justice and voting rights, that's Laura. Thank you, Laura. And last but certainly not least is Darlene Martinez. Uh, Darlene is the Honorable Constable of Downtown Phoenix, uh, elected to this Maricopa County Law Enforcement Office in 2018, where she in this position serves many formal criminal and civil uh, uh, orders for justice courts, including protection orders, summons, subpoenas, and warrants. She also executes uh, writs of possession when renters and property owners have disagreements, maintaining respectful and dignified relationships while providing public safety. And she was inspired to do public service as an openly gay person through her interactions with Harvey Milk in 1976. So, that's what we're gonna say about you now because we wanna hear what you have to say about the movie and read what our attendees have to say. So thank you all for facilitating and I'm gonna back out of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, I wanted to start our discussion by talking a little bit about the filmmaker, Julia Riker. She's a first generation um, feminist. She still identifies as a socialist feminist. She's from a working class background. And she went to college at Antioch in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which was a kind of a, a center of, of activism, anti-war activism, civil rights activism, women's movement activism. And she was part of a collective of filmmakers who wanted to use their films to uh, challenge the inequities they saw and to promote social change. And she has now been a filmmaker for 50 years. And there is now a national retrospective of all of her films, three of which were nominated for Academy Awards. And last year she won an Academy Award for a film that she did about a factory in Dayton, Ohio. And um, she always tells her stories through the voices of working class people. And she tries to back herself out of the film. And I think you saw the way in which she only prompts a few narrators. And then she uses the leadership of the organizing to tell the story of what happens. She blends in uh, uh, archival films uh, and uh, photographs, which add that historical dimension to it. And you probably got a kick out of how the, the eye, eyewear they were using then has come back in style. Um, the hairdos, the clothing, you know, it's really uh, fun to see that. But it was a very, the movie captures a very vibrant uh, period in the contemporary women's movement, late 60s, early 70s. And I wanted to start by asking the panelists, the women who became involved uh, and who were the spokesperson, particularly Ellen Cassidy and uh, Karen Nussbaum, 
they came to union organizing through other kinds of organizing. And what were some of the other social movements that they were involved in and how might they have impacted the women's movement? Well, I think there's a real intersection between uh, women's rights in, in general in the workplace and in, in voting rights. And, and someone, someone was asking in the chat while we were watching the movie sort of what the relationship was between the nine to five women and the equal rights amendment, you know, were they, were they fighting for that? And I, you know, even though there are so many shared goals, sometimes there is a little bit of an uncomfortable jostle. You saw many of the nine to five women didn't want to identify themselves as feminists. And I think we still see that today that people are, are reluctant to use that word. So I think that it's an interesting intersection for sure. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, you know, I, am I unmuted? <laughs> You're fine. Okay, I agree. And, you know, I think that even how they united the, the both the women of color and the women of not and tried to get them to come out of their shell to even speak with each other and actually engage in things that they were unfamiliar with was even a hard task at that time and even now. Why do you think their, their um, situation was invisible? And um, what strategies did the organizers use to make to organize them into a collective voice that could address the problems they encountered. What were some of their strategies and tactics? Wow, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they were invisible because of the fact that they had, they were secretive because of the fact that they had, they were doing something that was not a heard of to begin with. Right. I mean, they were, first of all, uh, being secretive because they had to be. Uh, they were losing their jobs if they were talking, merely even talking about it, much less organizing into something that they had to do that they were not being encouraged to, much less not wanting to do because they didn't want to lose their jobs. That was all they had to begin with. Would you agree with that, Laura? I would, and I what struck me in, in watching that was how similar the organizing techniques are then versus now. Those same grassroots techniques of leafleting and newsletters and catchy signs, but also, you know, one of the things that I really loved that they did in, in terms of inclusivity was meeting the women where they were at, doing those lunches and the surveys so they could actually find out, you know, what, what is going on in the workplaces, you know, from the women involved. I, I think that that's such a key part of, of or, organizing both historically and modern is you actually have to address the, the problems and, and talk to the people involved and advocate that that's, way. Yeah, that's a good point. In fact, the filmmaker said it took her seven years to make this film and it was really the Me Too movement and Time's Up that gave the final impetus for the fundraising that made the film possible. So uh, these women were talking about and documenting their experiences with sexual harassment in the seventies. Um, and yet we still see this groundswell in a recent period, uh, but they had uh, very um, uh, difficult circumstances on, uh, in their employment situation. Um, what about, the movie Nine to Five. How did that play into the organizing? Did you did either of you see the original Nine to Five with Jane Fonda? And what 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 was the relationship between Jane Fonda and the activists there? <laughs> well, I, I, for me, yeah, I I, def I saw the movie when it first came out, so I'm going to go ahead and give up my age at that point. Uh, <laughs> so I remember when it actually first came out. I remember uh, in the making of it. Um, and what all was taking place and, and how the women were responding and how they were reacting because it was such a, you know, I could relate to the woman when she was talking about when they saw it on the screen and how they were wanting to scream out at, at, the, at Jane Fonda when she was talking about the, the machine coming undone and what they wanted to do and say and, and how they wanted to respond because it was, it was real to them. It was real to all of us that we wanted to, to say something about it and be a part of that because it was, it, it was real to us. It wasn't just a movie. It was about mm -hmm. things that we were living and feeling. Mm -hmm. What about that song Dolly Parton wrote, Nine to Five? That became the anthem, they said in the movie. I um, loved it. I loved the detail about the washboard uh, with her fingernails. I thought that was great. Uh -huh. <laughs> that made it for me. The, 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 the anthem of that just made it. Just, it, it just made it perfect. Yeah. And how about the women when Jane Fonda was doing the research for the movie and asked them, did anybody ever want to fantasize about killing their boss? And the women were really shocked themselves that everybody had had those 
uh, uh, fantasy. fantasy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I love the fact that they put the whole thing about the coffee into yeah. the movie and they integrated that into the fantasy of it. But they actually integrated the whole thing about him asking for the coffee. And they made that an integral part of the movie about him asking for the coffee more than once and what it did and how it, it aggravated into a portion of the movie. So I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. One of their other things had to do with the fact that the issues that they used to, or they said, keep it simple, meet the women where they are, give them an action plan. So they had these sort of uh, tactics in mind for organizing, but wages were important, but that wasn't the only thing. What were some of the other issues that struck you as important to the women and that might be important today? Well, I think it's the treatment for me. I mean, you know, the things they had to do to, you know, for, for, for their bosses. I mean, I, I thought that was interesting that they did a shows on Phil Donahue mm -hmm. of the things that they had to do and they made a show out of it, uh, the most horrible things they had to do for a boss. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I can't imagine them doing something like that today because I know things like some of those things still are taking place. You're not going to tell me some of those things aren't taking place still today. I mean, maybe not to that degree, but, you know, some of those things I'm sure are still going on. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Laura? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and some of it, I mean, we were mentioning in the chat about, about um, undocumented women, undocumented workers, that there are many avenues that are still jobs that are still working without set job descriptions. Like that's a very stressful place to be in, to, to not have any sort of idea day to day of what, what is gonna be asked of you. And then not feeling like you can say no because you're so dependent on the job or your job, your boss is in such a position of power. Right. And I think you'll see that today. I mean, in, in a lot of arenas. So it's, it's unfortunate that yeah. we're still dealing with these issues. Exactly. In the survey that the women, they passed out those surveys and they wrote over and over again about not being, a, not having a job description. That was one of the issues. Uh, being treated like a girl, a child. When it was the phrase she said that she was a girl from the day she was hired until retirement, you know, it was just uh, uh, the notion that these women were there to serve male bosses. Um, how about like, where was their status? Like they were sort of caught between the women's movement um, where working class women's voices may not have been as prominent and the labor movement, which had been male dominated. It has changed and we can talk a little bit about that later, but they, they were excluded. They were in that in-between space, uh, which meant that they had to cultivate their own skills and their own, uh, develop their own voice and develop their own leaders. And I think that's what all of the women who are looking back and reflecting on those early days, they're really talking about how they developed, um, how they became writers and speakers and leaders and how that carried over. Even if the union movement is in decline, the one woman says everyone still comes to her when there's a problem at work even ones who maybe are afraid of being organized. They still know they need somebody to represent their interests. Um, so, you know, did it take courage, you think, for those women to uh, stake out a place in the labor movement and in the women's movement? What do you think? I'll let you start oh. this one off, Laura. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And as you were describing that, sort of that, being stuck in that place between the women's movement and then the, the men and the sexism that you would sometimes see in, in labor unions, boy, that is an unenviable place to be in. Mm -hmm. And the Equal Rights Amendment actually has a really interesting history with labor. You know, it was introduced in, in the 20s um, as just a constitutional protection for, for men and women under the law. And organized labor came out pretty strongly against it in its, in its early years because women had fought and fought and fought for this protective legislation yeah. mm -hmm. guaranteed them things that, that men didn't have. And so they were saying, if you pass this equal rights amendment, you're hurting us. And so that's a really interesting journey that that's taken. And now, you know, unions are generally very supportive yeah. of the equal rights amendment, but you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's an uncomfortable place to be in. And I think it took some time to sort of find their own place and their own voice in that. And, and it was really impressive the way that they built that space on their own, because that's what you have to do. When there's not a place for you, you make one. Well, exactly. And even with all of that, and that being said, and I agree with all of that, but even with all of that, 
and I know we aren't talking about it yet, but even with all of that, well, let's talk about the the, pay, the wage pay gender gap. I mean, mm-hmm. women still are not making, and I'm going to quote this, if we're in 2019 and 2020, women still are, ne- are only making 81 to 82% mm-hmm. less. I mean, a, a percentage of uh, 81 cents for every dollar that a man makes. And that's a reality. Yes, there's and, variation along race lines. Well, I'm gonna, I was going to get that? there, but okay, thank you for bringing it. that up there, Margaret. Got it. And so it starts out that it's interesting how it goes out. So for white women, it's 79 cents. For black women, it's 62. For Latinos, it's 54 cents. For Asian, it's 90, which I think that's very interesting. And for, uh, for Native American, it's 57 cents mm-hmm. for every dollar. So uh, for Latinos, yeah. For Latinos, it was 54 cents. Yeah. That's just shocking to me. That is still so even with all of this going on now, this movie, we're talking 53 years ago, they were doing all of this. And extremely, I, I think it was they were very brave to even get out there and talk about this and do all this. And I give them kudos and and I was part of all of that in the beginning, getting out there. I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've walked on the lines. I've been out there. I've, I've held signs to, to do all that and be a part of all that. And I'm very proud to have said I've, I've been uh, on the lines. I've been out there and I'm still out there trying to, we're all out there try, trying to make a difference, but we still have so much farther to go. Mm-hmm. And I hope that in my lifetime that I still see that because I will say I'm very proud that I see a, a vice president, a woman vice president, and I get to see that in my lifetime. Yeah. And a, and a, and a, and a president and vice president who say they support unions because exactly. you saw in the movie what happened to the labor movement when Ronald Reagan came in and uh, right. the union busting tactics that were used. And when you think about all the struggles of the the low wage workers to achieve even that amount of security with the union and to begin to attack, you know, that. Um, in In the end though, they start talking about the economy changes, the occupations get restructured, there's a technology outsourcing, uh, expansion of the service economy. So there's a downsizing of the clerical workforce. And, but the new workforce that is a part of the uptake in the labor movement are home health care workers, domestic workers, child care workers, the fight for 15, which is to have the uh, minimum wage raised to 15. And yesterday on All Things Considered, they talked about how when um, in, the six, in the 30s, when it was the first time that they tried to set a lower floor on wages, but they excluded the occupations um, that were predominantly, uh, where uh, black workers were predominantly segregated, agriculture and um, domestic work. But it was the civil rights movement in the 60s that said, no, this fair, you know, the minimum wage has to be $2 an hour and it has to be across the board uh-huh. to everything. But do you know that $2 an hour in 1964 is $15 today? Wow. So there's really not, shocking. not that far fetched to be demanding $15 an hour. Not where our economy and not where, where labor and where, not where everything is. And the fact that we have not raised it in how many years, no, it is not. Where people are, where the economy and what people are making and what they should be making and how much, uh, how much it costs, our cost of living is and everything. No, it isn't. It's sad actually. Mm-hmm. And what teachers are making and what teachers do for our our country, it's 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 shocking what teachers make. And I mean, yeah. let's face it, 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 teachers are teaching our children, uh, uh, you know, our future. And the fact that what they're making is is just appalling. Laura, Laura, I see your yes on two hundred eight <laughs> back there. What is that? Tell us about that. Uh, So Proposition 208 passed in the 2020 election. Um, It was a property or a tax on anyone making more than $250,000 a year as an individual or $500,000 as a couple, and that additional 3% on any money over that 
uh, went to our public schools. And the reason that that was so important is Arizona is, um, if you're not familiar with the education system in Arizona, oh boy, I have bad news for you. What do you so Near the bottom at literally every single measure that you can possibly track. I mean, teacher pay, class sizes, student achievement, things like that. And it's because, uh, you know, our education system has just been starved so much. Um, I taught I started teaching in 2007 and I made more my first year teaching than I did five years later, even though I'd gotten a master's degree in that time. Mm -hmm. uh, Arizona cut more money from education during that 2008 to 2015 than any other state in the country. Mm -hmm. and, and we're a prosperous state. We should be able to fund our, our education system. And so 208 is a way to do that, although it's, um, you know, it faces aggressive attacks in the legislature every year and, and we're seeing that again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, you get me going on education. I okay. go. <laughs> well, I will say thank you for your service. <laughs> essential workers. You know, now we hear so much about the essential workers, and yet the essential workers are underpaid, um, overworked, don't have the. Another big issue is scheduling hours, not having set schedules so that you can plan your family life around going to work and, and coming home at the same time. So there are uh, an upsurge in labor campaigns. Some of them are union-based, some of them are community-based, some of them are worker centers, and so they're multifaceted. It's called alt-labor. So it's labor unions plus other types of organizing around labor issues. And some of them are campaigns like a 208, which was driven by the teachers' union, uh, some of the Fight for 15 SEIU that you saw in the movie has been very active in uh, getting that as a ballot initiative. So when the you can't get the state legislatures to move, then you put it on the ballot and people overwhelmingly support it. They also support more uh, uh, sick leave pay and they support extending uh, Obamacare to uh, Medicaid. So when it's on the ballot, the majority of Americans choose it. What were some, can you think of some group of workers that might have been left out of this account of the labor movement they, that may be more visible today? Um, well, I was thinking about queer labor activism and there's a, been a, a, many unions now have a lavender caucuses, pride caucuses, and there has been um, many, campaigns initiated by queer labor organizers around, uh, you know, the recent Supreme Court decision that treats uh, discrimination on the basis of a uh, gender expression or sexual orientation as on the same basis as we do sex discrimination, which was supported by many briefs of the court by uh, labor unions. But that's because their membership, their queer membership, the president of SEIU Mary Kay Henry is a lesbian and was the founder of the Lesbian Caucus in SEIU. So you see more women now, women, um, workers of color are the majority of union members. Uh, the, another area of labor activism is um, immigrant, uh, migrant workers and the labor, uh, and labor much like they had been against the ERA, they were not very uh, friendly towards uh, immigrant labor, but that has changed a lot. And so immigrant workers, undocumented workers, queer workers, trans workers, women, men of color, we've got a big uh, surge of uh, new workers into the labor movement. It's true. It's true. And discrimination does not does not see color, does not see your 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 sex or your type. It's just discrimination is discrimination, mm -hmm. period. And that's it. And I've seen a lot in my lifetime, I'll tell you. Yeah. I've been beat up five times in my lifetime and it did not see who or, 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 or what I was, period. Um, Julia Riker, the filmmaker, said she was inspired by Harvey Milk um, and the, har the film about Harvey Milk in San Francisco and other um, movies. In fact, she is a part of a a network called um, uh, New Day Films, which was a collective that was involved in distributing films before they were like streaming them. When you were teaching at a university, um, you could order these films and show them to your class. 
but uh, the big um, distributors wouldn't take up these kind of radical films. So she formed her own collective and they became famous and important. And uh, she has uh, also uh, did a film on, uh, it's called Seeing Red and it's about um, American communists. And she made that film because a previous film she made on, called Union Maids about the, the 30s and the, and the campaigns to organize workers in the 30s she had left out the role that communists had played in the 30s. So she makes up for it by doing Seeing Red. And it was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, right at the tail end of Jimmy Carter's presidency. So then Reagan comes in, but she already has the money. And so she's able to do that film. And it was nominated for an Academy Award as well. So she has a kind of a radical feminist socialist uh, orientation, but she's always featuring the voices of the workers, the working class, and women in particular. You know, you talk about voices who who aren't heard in, in some of these spaces, and it was making, it makes me think about, it, it's fascinating the way that labor really can play a role in advocating for social change. And in the Jim Crow era, you know, there weren't very many labor unions advocating for desegregation, but the ones that pushed for it and said, no, we don't want you know, our, our, our groups of workers to have separate bathrooms or separate lunches, they usually got it. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me so much of what we're seeing now with transgender discrimination. We're, we're still talking about bathrooms. It, it just goes to show what an old scare tactic this is. And that's what it is, it's a scare tactic. But there's space there. And, and a lot of the unions now do a lot of advocacy as, as we were talking about, but that intersection of social change that unions can get behind beyond just workers' rights. I'm fascinated by that. I think it's really important. And I, well, you know, I think it's interesting that there the unions are still so involved, but I think it's very interesting that I feel like the they're they're becoming more afraid of the unions. That the unions, I feel almost as if they are they're trying to diminish the unions in, in, in strength and, and in numbers. Mm -hmm. I, I almost feel like the, we had a, a larger amount of unions in, in days past than yeah. we do now. Yeah. And I think it's because they have, they have made a greater effort to diminish our unions and, and how many we had and in the numbers that we had. Yeah, in the 50s, about 32% of workers were members of unions. Now it's down around 10. And for private sector unions, like in manufacturing, it's around 6%. Uh, it's the public sector unions that have still have any sort of a membership base. Um, but they are involved in these uh, ballot initiatives and campaigns as another way of, because the way work is organized, like gig workers, it's harder to organize them into unions. Although you see them doing that and Uber drivers and Google workers and Amazon workers, the big box store, they're all beginning to um, you know, try to organize in some fashion. Do we have any questions from the um, audience? Can you see the chat box? Let's go ahead and open, yeah, open the floor for questions from the audience. And um, what I'll do is I'll forward those over into the Zoom chat for y'all to see. But for now, maybe if there's any other topics that we want to go over while I collect some of those questions. Well, one of the things I wanted to say was that I just thought that the nine to five movement was so su successful because they made such a great effort to involve all the women. It wasn't just one segregation of women or one portion of the women. They got all the women involved. I love that they went to, I loved that they said that they would go inside the women's offices. Like it, there was no, there was no uh, documentation of how they went to them. They actually went to their desk just to engage all the women, but they went to all of them. They engaged every single one of them to speak with them and talk to them, get their information but they involved everyone together. I love that. And they would partner them up. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that they did that. That was one of yeah. my favorite that things was, that they did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right, Darlene. They were conscious and intentional about and I, confronting racism and creating interracial teams. How about when they had to fight for tampons and talked with those men about the tampon machines? I think that's still a current issue on many campuses. Young feminists <laughs> have been around that issue. 
And I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was brilliant. You can you imagine how uncomfortable that made the men mm -hmm. that they probably didn't even know what to do or how to even address that? Mm -hmm. I see some of the questions coming in through the, the chat yeah, here. Um, chat here. Yeah, feel feel, mean, feel free to go ahead and address those. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So one, one says, how do, how do you create new unions when people are more distant? Who wants to address that? You can well, start the ills of social media, you know, we got to do it. It's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but so much of organizing happens. Uh, not even, I mean, social media in general, but Facebook specifically. Uh, which is something that it will be interesting to see how that evolves and changes in the, in the next several years. But I think that that social media and then some of the same tactics of surveys, you know, finding out what are those challenges that you're facing? How can we support, you know, what are actions we can take to support that? I think that's how you, how you start at least. Just gathering information from people is how you start. It's when you, it's, it's, it's not just meeting in person, but it's just talking to people. It's gathering information from people. It's, it's organized. That's like what I said, my favorite mantra is organize, mobilize, win. Mm -hmm. It's just getting information from people, uh, uh, gathering people. That's what I'm saying. These women went to their desks, talk to them, involve them. When you get people together and involve them in something or anybody, you get people engaged together. Is something that matters to them, then that then they will be they will get engaged in with whatever matters to you. If it's of their like mind and it's something that matters to them and you're doing something for them, they'll be they'll become engaged and involved. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. If it if it helps them, I mean, we're talking about pay, we're talking about your benefits, we're talking about, you know, like some of these uh, men were getting a time. What was that new thing where men were getting more time off or to be able to be with their newborns and 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 uh, something like that. So if it helps them, that's what it's about. Um, what is the extent of the male presence and the support of the ERA and nine to five allies? Read that one. Yeah, that, that, that a lot of these movements have uh, have allies you know, civil rights movement, their allies. And so I just wondered, certainly there were some men out there who, who supported, I know this film isn't about them, but the extent to which this movement also affects men means that men have an investment in, in supporting this. So I'm just wondering if there's any, any, any documented evidence of, of those who are out there trying to affect change, not to take anything from the fact that that, that women are leading this, but I'm just wondering if there's any support system out there for men who also engage in these issues in any kind of meaningful way. Well, for me, you know, I think it's just like in the LGBTQ world, there's always a straight allies. So, you know, I think anybody that is supportive, and I don't care if it is male or female, if, if you're in support and you're willing to help any organization and or any, um, any type of movement, if you're in support and you're willing to give out that, that help in whatever capacity that is, or if you're willing to, if it's red for red and you're willing to go out and get signatures or mm -hmm. you're willing to get out there and march or do whatever, it's support. Would you agree with that, Laura? Absolutely. And I, I think that in, you know, you need those allies, you, you need them. And, and the local ERA task force in Arizona did a fascinating campaign, I believe last summer, social media campaign that was men talking about why the Equal Rights Amendment would be important to them, either for you know their wife, their sister, their mother, their mm -hmm. daughter, um, and really looking at that and, and hopefully spurring other men on to think about you know how does this impact me and, and my life beyond just mm -hmm. you know myself, so. Mm -hmm. Because not, not all well, really quick, I just add on to that because even though they're they're because not all men have not all men can work. Some of them, their wife is working or their wife is making a better living than they are. So the some of the women are out there working and they're the ones with the job. So their household is dependent on their wives working. So it affects them in that capacity. Would you agree? Oh, great point. Yeah. And especially in this modern era and COVID. And that sort of leads into the next question too. COVID has upturned so many things. You know, how has COVID changed and how will that impact unions? 
Uh, one really interesting area I think we're seeing this play out before our eyes is the teachers unions. Um, there are many teachers who feel they don't feel safe going back to work right now and the role that the unions are playing in, in managing that and, and meeting the needs of the students while also making sure that everyone is safe. It's, it's a big job right now, but I'm glad that there are people that, that will advocate for that because it's, it's important. So, I mean, that's at least how I've seen it with, with the teachers unions. And I feel that teachers are essential workers. I, I mean, they should be vaccinated. I, I, I know I'm getting my second shot on Sunday because I am actually out there serving papers and I'm dealing with the public every day. However, teachers, I've, I've got a friend who just got vaccinated actually yesterday and uh, she's a substitute teacher. And so she's out there and she's going to, they want her to come back and start working. So I'm glad that she got vaccinated, but what about all the other teachers that they want to get back in by March? Well, I feel like they should all be vaccinated. Their children are, are, are there's so many uh, households that have, have multi-generational people living with them. So it isn't just the kids going home to parents, they're going home to grandparents who are living with them. So we're talking about several people uh, being able to be infected. So why would we not want to have them uh, vaccinated? Well, that's, that's interesting. I'll add one other comment that, uh, and Mary Margaret, you may know about this since you're connected with ASU, but some of the buzz around uh, U of A and, and ASU and, and unionizing uh, is the result of COVID in many respects. So that was the question about how will that impact unions? I'd never heard the buzz that I'm hearing now, but specifically related to you know going back into the classroom when people don't feel safe. So that has actually not hindered, but actually given rise to more conversation, thinking, action around. Yeah. I thought it was interesting, too, that these women featured in the film, many of them worked at colleges and universities, University of Cincinnati, Cuyahoga Community College, Harvard. OK, so you've got from college, uh, community college to an elite Harvard. And yet the secretaries have the same experiences with low pay and mistreatment and lack of respect. And universities are considered liberal workplaces. And who are they liberal for? The janitorial staff, the, the secretaries, the office workers, you know, the groundskeeper. I think if you've talked to different sectors of workers at ASU, you would find different uh, experiences with being employed by ASU. Teacher, the professors have one angle and, you know, the groundskeepers have another. But yes, I do think there's an uptick in uh, union campaigns uh, in places. So they keep saying like uh, Ed for Red, Arizona, Oklahoma, and West Virginia had three big teacher strikes. And one of the, uh, the CBS Evening News contacted, the producer contacted me to talk about why I thought conservative teachers in conservative states where you don't think of there being union activism, why were these teachers on going on strike? And I, I kind of made the argument that teachers are on the front lines in communities. They know who's abused. They know who's hungry. They know who needs health care. And so like they were um, in these areas that were really hard hit even before COVID. And so like their, um, their activism was not just about the teacher's pay, but it was about the quality of education. It was about the, um, the, the food served uh, to low-income students through the schools. It was, you know, policing in the schools. That's another big issue. And so uh, when the teachers went on strike, it was for the bus drivers. It was for the kitchen workers. It was for the entire staff that makes the schools go, not just teachers. Essential workers. Mm -hmm. So are there, are there any uh, kind of burning questions or or lingering you know kind of what what you your biggest takeaway from this documentary is as we move towards sort of winding down because you've covered a lot it covered a lot and you've given us a lot of spaces but any 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 burning takeaways or you know i suggested in the quote in the in the chat over on the other platform that maybe we'll all get together and watch nine to five outside someplace on a giant screen yeah that would be cool because i haven't seen it i know uh -huh. the song but i never oh, yeah. oh my gosh it's such yeah. a great yeah. movie <laughs> and we can all sing the song theme song when it comes on yeah uh -huh. cool. so in, any any yeah, my my takeaway is change takes as long as it takes 
Mm. And Julia Reichert and her partner have been making these films for five decades. And they have been, each film is even the production quality, the aesthetics of the film, the voice of the people, it, it it's, gets stronger. And so like it, when you see people stay at it year after year, decade after decade, you know, that's what it takes to change. It takes courage. It takes hanging in there. It takes uh, recovering. Those, those women at the University of Cincinnati didn't win the first time, yeah. but they sure did win big the second time. Yeah. So what if they had folded up and gone home? You know, they wouldn't have won. So, you know, it just, it's hard and tough. These are tough times, um, but we have to elect people who support workers' rights. You know, that's a part of what we have to do. All right. Laura? I'd say that my takeaway is just the tremendous power of, of women when they get together and allies, of course, too, you know, but but women, I think there's something really special about that when you sort of join together for a shared sense of purpose. And even when there aren't successes in the traditional sense, just the the training and the camaraderie that you go through and, and, and the idea that, you know, I can have a voice in this and it does mean something. I think that's so powerful. And I'm so grateful to those women for doing that because they paved the way for so many of the things that I take for granted today. And I think it's really important to, to always look back and, and honor those sacrifices. Right, yeah. That must've been a real Probably. magic moment for you as well with uh, right after 2016 and one of those first big move marches was of women coming together globally that on some level had to be uh, encouraging, inspiring. There was still work to do, but there was a moment that people could hang on to. Oh, yeah, so Darlene. Well, for me, I've been through, I was at the, well, with Harvey, we took, it took us three tries to get him elected. So I understand the loss. Mm -hmm. And I remember marching on Orange Tuesday and uh, Nita Bryant, when I saw that Nita Bryant, picture of Nita Bryant that was on Orange Tuesday, which was right after she came out, uh, mm -hmm. we marched on Orange Tuesday after that's why it was called that. But, and I've marched on several other uh, big events and pride and whatnot. But, you know, I am so very proud to know that I've marched with so many wonderful people in so many incredible events and been a part of so many <sighs> heartful things to know that women of all colors and ages and times have come together to be so strong, so resilient. And there have, yes, been so many incredible men that have been a part of that who are brave enough to speak out on behalf of so many um, women who've gone through so much hardship. And to them, I say kudos as well. And for all the young people who have come out to do things to be a part of it, I'm always so amazed at the resilience of young people who want to become a part of it all. So I started a company called Future Leaders Consulting. It's a political consulting firm that gets young people involved in political uh, things because it's um, great to see people want to get involved in that. Thank you for involving me in this project. Uh, it was absolutely fabulous to be a part of this and to be a part of uh, this group was fantastic and I really enjoyed it. The, the movie was fantastic. I love, I, I'm really happy to want to see the movie with you all nine to five because it's a great movie, but this was a, an incredible experience today. I want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart letting me be part of this humanities project. Um, thank you to everybody who came tonight to watch this and to be a part of this. Remember to, we are all in this together. This is an incredible project and we do have, Mary Margaret, you're absolutely correct. We have so much more to go, so much more to do. And to the ladies that made this movie, thank you for your hard work. There's so much that we have yet to do. Thank you. Well, Darlene, I could not have ended on a, on a better note than you just took us out. So all I'll say again is thank you. I can't thank you all enough for such wonderful chemistry in that. I mean, it's just, you brought out all these nuances and we can only say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to our attendees. Do know that we'll be sending out a follow-up email to all of those who registered and weren't able to come and those who did come so that we'll be adding more resources. And I'm not kidding, maybe, you know, maybe it's post COVID, but we're going to watch that movie together someplace. So if you've got any ideas about a drive-in where we can show this, I would love to follow up with this as a part two. So there is, there is work to be done. 
everyone. And we are here to try to move this conversation to action. So thank you all. There's a feedback survey that we love for people to take because we love to get feedback if it's constructive. We also invite you to take our pledge as Humanity 101 pledge. It's about faith in humanity, not, not, not based on any sort of faith system. But if we talk about this movement, it is really about granting humanity and dignity to folks. We had that in Jim Crow, as you mentioned, Laura, but we also have it in this movement. So, you know, when we're talking about compassion and empathy and forgiveness, integrity, kindness, respect, and self-reflection. This is about making us do better and be better. So only if you can commit to these do we want you to sign it. We don't want any people who don't care about this signing our pledge, okay? Uh, but thank you very much. Follow our new events. We've got one coming up uh, uh, on, in March on toxic positivity. Uh, that, that is really important when we talk about losses and how do you grow from losses uh, rather than sort of putting a cherry on top of a pile of poop. So thank you all again very much and, and stay connected with Project Humanity. Be well, be safe, stay socially distanced, mask, do whatever you can to keep yourself safe and others around us safe. Good evening and thank you.